Determining whether a review is fake or maybe a little bit less credible is becoming harder and harder to do. And I'm talking about all formats of product reviews. I'm talking about video reviews from influencers. I'm talking about online written reviews on Sephora, on other retailers. And I wanna talk all things fake reviews today in Makeup Musings. I think most of the products we're gonna use today are from my recent Sephora haul. You watched that try on. If you did not, I can leave it linked, but I actually think I'm gonna start with Fenty Eastraw. I wear this in the shade three, but what got me really thinking about this topic was something I noticed recently on Sephora. And this is definitely not an isolated incident to this one brand and this one review topic. This happens a lot, but I wanna use this singular product as an example because I think it illustrates it perfectly. And it's the new Unseen Mineral Sunscreen from Supergoop. Not to be confused with the original Unseen, which is phenomenal, the new mineral version, I did not like. Like at all. Be prepared to see that in my worst products of 2024 video this December. But when that product launched, I, I mentioned in a video, it was terrible for me. In my, in my opinion, in my experience, it was a horrible, horrible, horrible sunscreen. I will show you a photo, but warning, jump scare. Even on my fair skin, I looked like a ghost. The cast from that sunscreen was significant, and yet the reviews were stellar. Like this was before the product had even launched. It wasn't available to the public yet, but it had hundreds of five-star reviews. And I was like, well, that's a little bit weird. And then I quickly noticed that every single one of those reviews had the little incentivized toggle on. And I wanna preface this by saying, I am not accusing Supergoop of doing anything shady. Every brand does this. They all send out products beforehand for people to test out. This is not isolated to Supergoop. I just think this illustrates it really well. All of those incentivized reviews were five stars. And I was flabbergasted. I'm like, were we trying the same product? I genuinely, like, obviously things work differently for everyone, but I cannot wrap my head around five stars. I'm like, really? I don't know, we all have different skin, but for me, it was terrible. But did you know you can toggle that off? So I did that, I turned that off. So I did it so it would only show me non-incentivized reviews. And for that, the reviews are terrible. There are only a few people that had tried it, but it was mostly one star. And this has gotten me thinking a lot about fake reviews. And we knew fake reviews existed. I am not spilling some like undercover tea right now. You're like, girl, I know fake reviews are a thing. But I feel like misleading reviews are getting a little bit harder to track. And not, I'm not even necessarily talking about this example, like I have a lot more examples in the video, stay tuned. But shortly after the super goop fiasco, I was reading this article from Business of Fashion titled, Beauty Reviews Were Already Suspect, Then Came Generative AI. And in the article, they talked about a lot of shady, beauty product reviews that are happening from a lot of different methods, some from actual users, some from AI. And this was a really interesting topic for me to even consider the idea that a lot of these reviews that are fake are maybe not even written by humans. Business of Fashion writes, AI makes it easier to mimic real reviews faster, better, and at a greater scale than ever before, creating more risk for shoppers being taken in by bogus testimonials. They also write, fake reviews have become an industry themselves, driven by fraud farms that act as syndicates. A 2021 report by FakeSpot found that roughly 31% of reviews across Amazon, Sephora, Walmart, eBay, Best Buy, and sites powered by Shopify which altogether account for more than half of US online retail sales last year, were unreliable. And again, I'm not accusing Supergoop or any of these brands of doing this, but it, it raises an interesting topic. And it reminds me a bit of the Sunday Riley scandal. Do you remember this from a few years ago? If you're not familiar, Sunday Riley was accused by the FTC 
uh, writing fake reviews on Sephora. According to a New York Times article, Sunday Riley encouraged their employees to register under different identities so they could post multiple reviews of Sunday Riley products and inflate the product's ratings. The email that the employees received included step-by-step -step instructions how to set up a VPN, a virtual private network, which allowed employees to conceal their online activity while making new profiles. So they were just doing all these different reviews saying they were different people, but like these were all employees by Sunday Riley and their boss was making them do this. Now this was years ago, but if you didn't know what ended up happening to Sunday Riley in the end, it wasn't much. The settlement did not require them to provide any refunds to customers. It did not require them to admit any wrongdoing. They were just told by the FTC, don't do that anymore. Please don't write any more fake reviews. And when it comes to those incentivized reviews that you see on Sephora that have the little like incentivized flair in the corner, many of them are coming from Influencer. So anyone can sign up for Influencer. You receive products, you receive them for free, you test them out, you leave a review. And Influencer says they do not require and they don't suggest that the tester automatically gives a positive review of the product. They want a genuine review of the product. But one tester notes in that Business of Fashion article, people don't want to stop receiving free stuff if they say something honest or negative about the products they received for free. Now, I don't want to suggest for a minute that you cannot accurately or even negatively review a product you received for free. If you watch my channel, you watch me do it all the time. But I do see a pretty clear correlation between the, the ranking of the reviews on Sephora and whether or not they are incentivized. The article specifically notes the new way hair gloss treatment and at the time of the article, it had 1,182 reviews with an average rating of 4.3, but when you filter out the incentivized reviews, there are only 89 and the rating drops all the way down to a 2.6. And I'm very, very, very curious to hear if you're watching this and you have reviewed for Influencer before, what your experience has been, if you enjoyed the product, if you reviewed it positively or negatively, and then if you receive other products after that, let us know. But I do think this then makes it very difficult for the consumer to navigate reviews that are genuine. You know, you're going to an online review, you assume like that's positive. These are normal people trying the products. I should be able to trust their opinions, but that's not always the case. And from the perspective of these brands, I understand why they would want to incentivize people to use their products. And I don't even mean just like incentivize positive reviews. I mean, I understand why they would want to incentivize reviews in general. Because for the most part, people rarely leave a review if they like a product and or if the product is just mediocre. And this happens far beyond beauty. I feel like the best example of this is a dentist. When I first moved here three years ago, I needed to find a new dentist. It was a journey. There are dentists office with good reviews do not exist. And then when they do, it's kind of sketchy too, because you're like, wait, why are these all five stars? But for the most part, any dentist office I looked into, they all had like two to three stars because people are only leaving online reviews when they've had problems with their dental work. You didn't go in and get a good cleaning and think, okay, yeah, let me go give them four stars because I had an average experience. No, it's kind of human nature to usually only leave a review if you had like a noteworthy experience. If it was like the best thing you've ever received, or you had a horrible experience, you might leave a review. But like, unless people are incentivized to leave reviews, a lot of times they're not gonna go out of their way and take time out of their busy schedule to go leave a review for fun. I mean, some people will, but like, I get why brands want to incentivize more people to leave reviews. By the way, second time using this Glossier bronzer, I think I'm liking it. It's very, very light. And so I feel like it's pretty subtle. But I like that about it, you know? I like my bronzer not to be too dark because I feel like it just makes it easier for me to work with. So far, so good. Gonna go with a little bit of blush. This is from Patrick Ta. This is the shade She's Blushing. They just sent me this one. I've used it once and I really, really like it. But I'm gonna go in with the blush shade or like, <laughs> duh, they're both blushes. I'm gonna go in with the powder shade first and then we'll do the cream on top, which is the Patrick Ta method. And these positive reviews have a direct correlation to sales of the product. And that New York Times article that I referenced that I will also leave linked down below noted that a one star rating increase, just one star increase on Yelp could mean the difference between five to 9% increase 
in revenue. So yeah, makes sense why they're gonna want some positive reviews. And we're going to see AI start playing an even bigger role in this. Even if they're not fully AI formed reviews, now we're kind of seeing a hybrid where it's partially done by a real person, partially done by AI. Bizarra Voice, a platform for user-generated content which owns Influencer and works with beauty brands including L'Oreal, Pacifica, Clarins, and Sephora, recently launched three new AI-powered features, including a tool called Content Coach. The company developed the tool based on research showing that 68% of its community had trouble getting started writing a review. Contents Coach uses prompts of key topics to include in their review based on common themes and other reviews. The prompts for a review of a Chanel eyeliner might include pigmentation, precision, ease of removal. As users type their review, the prompts light up as they're addressed, gamifying the process. And that really went like ding, ding, ding in my head because if you ever tried to read reviews of something on Amazon and you're like, all these reviews keep using the same words over and over again. They're like formatted slightly differently. There you go. And while these prompts are still intended to be neutral, it's definitely something to be aware of when you're reading through and you're like, okay, now I see. I'm seeing the same phrases over and over again. And then that can still be very genuine for the reviewer. They're just kind of being reminded of maybe different topics to touch on in the review, but I think it's noteworthy at least to be aware of to be better informed consumers when we're reading through those reviews. But I also think there's another skill set to be aware of as consumers when we're watching online reviews, and that's what I want to talk about now, but it's not what you think. Well, maybe it is, but I don't think it is. What I hear so often when I hear people describing not so genuine online reviews from influencers is the idea of like filters, like these aren't trustworthy because the people might be using filters. And I will say like that definitely exists and that can happen, but depending on the medium, I don't feel like filters are necessarily the bad guy we should be focusing on as much as other things. So just to speak from a creator perspective, on YouTube, I mean, I'll even speak for myself. I film my YouTube videos on a DSLR camera. It's a Canon 80D. There's no filter in my camera, though some cameras do have a built-in filter. My camera does not. I don't put a filter on in post, none of that. But even without actually using a filter, like there are ways that the camera distorts and changes the way cosmetics appear compared to what you might experience in real life. But I will say as an aside, I, I tend to assume there's a filter on on TikTok because the beauty filter is very easily turned on and it's not even like so noticeable to the eye. So on TikTok, I usually assume there's a filter, though maybe there isn't, but I usually assume that there is. But even pretending we're not even speaking about filters, let's say just for this moment here, filters don't exist, we're just talking about cameras. The way that product and just lighting and anything translates on camera can be night and day from what you're seeing in real life. And the biggest difference, in my opinion, is with the finish. So something matte on camera will look more blurred. Like if I were to go and apply copious amounts of powder to the point that if you were to see me in real life, you would be like, what's wrong with your face? And I were to wear that on camera, I would look like a blurred, perfected angel. Like it would look beautiful on camera, even though it would look bananas in real life. But by contrast, if I were to sit here with a very dewy face, it would translate disgusting on camera. But if you were to see me in person, you would be like, okay, you're so glowy, it looks beautiful, it looks radiant, it looks natural. And I say that because I feel like it's important to be a little bit weary about reviews with this in mind. So. The one place where I see it the most is in powder reviews, especially in short form content. I will see the creator come on camera, mega, mega dewy face sitting under lights. It's not gonna look nice. Every pore is gonna be emphasized. And then they take their little puff and they tap over it and it looks like they applied a filter to their face. It's night and day, it is dramatic, it's entertaining in a short form video, but it's not telling the whole story. Like in real life, what does it look like? I don't know, but on camera, just by the nature of how cameras work and how light reflects, yeah, that was gonna happen. You could take baby powder and put it on your face and it would look like a high-end, expensive, beautiful, high-quality formula powder just because by contrast of the shiny side, 
this face would be, or the side would be smoothed out. You know what I mean? And I even want to clarify, I don't think these creators are doing anything intentionally shady by showing a before and after. I think the comparison actually can be very helpful to the viewer, but I point this out just so we can have a better understanding of how things might actually be looking in person and how sometimes a video alone won't tell the full story. And I feel like out of all product categories, powder is the one that is most extreme and most visible on camera but I feel like this happens with foundation too people will apply foundation in like a short and they'll be like oh the coverage you could take a skin tint and it would look like full coverage if you just did a stripe of it and didn't blend it out even like same with highlights when we were in the highlighter craze like if you turn to the side and you have lights on and you apply a pile of highlighter yeah it's gonna be reflective I will say speaking for myself before I was filming content, I was less aware of how products translate on camera like that. Like now I feel like I can see it. I'm like, no, I don't think that powder is that good. I think your face was just dewy beforehand. But I also recognize how that information could be kind of used to deceive someone that maybe is not as familiar. Beyond that, um, sometimes video quality gets compressed so much that the products just look better, okay? And I say this especially on YouTube, sometimes on Instagram for me too, but on YouTube especially, if I have a short that I have filmed on my DSLR camera, so it, in theory, should be the exact same quality that you are watching here, and I upload it on YouTube, YouTube compresses the quality so much that like things just look more blurred because the quality is compressed so much like you're not seeing as much of like the pores and the skin as I intended for you to when it was filmed because of how it gets distorted in the upload process which again I feel like can then lead to products maybe translating a little bit better on camera even if they didn't in real life even beyond that there are so many other factors for the reviewer that are going to influence how product works for them compared to how it might work for someone else obviously age skin type preference but even something like having lip filler a lip product is just gonna look better over a lip filler that just is what it is so you might be watching a review from someone that has lip filler to be clear I don't see anything wrong with lip filler this is no negative assessment of lip filler I'm just like speaking about how a product will perform differently but a product or a lip product is probably gonna look so smooth and beautiful on someone with lip filler because their lines or their lips will not have the same lines and creases that unfilled lips have. And the reviewer might love the product. Does that mean they're being untrustworthy? No, they just have lip filler, so the product performs differently for them. But someone without lip filler might hate that product. It might sit terribly on their lips. And I feel like this was the case with the liquid lipstick craze. I'm sorry, if you have lip filler, you probably look incredible in liquid lipsticks. But speaking for myself, my lips look like a shriveled up mess in those like crusty matte liquid lipsticks. And I remember being so confused, like why is it not looking like that on me? But even preference, like someone could genuinely be giving an honest review and they love a product and then you think it is absolute garbage the worst thing in the world like it is just so interesting how things work so differently and I experience this firsthand all the time when I'm passing on my decluttered products to my friends and family because there have been things that I despise but then I give them to someone else and they're like this is my holy grail by the way I am using this, this is Cleona. Look at me using a green eyeshadow. When we were in New Orleans at Creators and Friends, they gave us some shadows and this is the shade Alloy. It's my first time using it. These are like super duper fragile. I have to be careful. I feel like this is kind of crumbling a little bit, but look at me go. Look at me wearing green eyeshadow. Okay, this brown mascara, I mentioned it in my last video. It's from Essence. It's the Lash Without Limits in the shade Brown. It's definitely a more subtle mascara, but it is such a good shade of brown. I really, 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 really like this. Look at that, so pretty. Okay, I'm gonna take Baddest Beige, this lip liner from e.l.f., apply that. And I definitely don't think like short form reviews are necessarily always gonna be misleading, but I do think there is very limited information that you can share in like 10 seconds to one minute. 
If anything, I kind of like to think of them as a jumping off point. I'm like, let me start there. Let me watch some longer form reviews. Let me get a few different opinions. Like I think they serve their purpose, but I also think sometimes they only tell like part of the story, you know? These are just so creamy, I really like these. Now I'm gonna take the Hard Candy Lip Oil in the shade Pink Paradise. So juicy. In general, I still find online reviews for product helpful, but I think it's important to be a little bit weary and to be knowledgeable of ways that these reviews can be deceiving regardless of the format you're consuming them. Let me know your thoughts on online reviews in all their many formats, but thank you so much for watching and I will see you in my next one. Bye.